Hi, I'm Lorraine Gamroff, the co-founder and CEO of Sentby. For several years now, people have been very excited by the potential of blockchain technology. If you listen to the pundits, they promise that blockchain will be able to disrupt businesses from finance companies like banks, supply chain, and a host of others. But what you don't really hear so much about today when you hear people speaking of blockchain is the original notion of what blockchain was and that is derived from the inventor himself which was electronic cash in the form of Bitcoin. Blockchain has even become one of the pillars of the fourth industrial revolution. The concept was popularized after the publication of the Bitcoin white paper by the pseudonymous inventor Satoshi Nakamoto. The title of the original white paper includes the line, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. But this has not limited innovators and entrepreneurs from coming up with all kinds of other use cases. In the 10 years of its existence, there has been massive investment into the space to fund startups and, and proofs of concept. Companies like IBM and Amazon are offering frameworks and services to allow businesses and other organizations to experiment and explore the potential. Large financial institutions like banks and stock exchanges have been experimenting with blockchains. Even central banks are openly discussing and considering central bank digital currencies or CBDCs that could possibly leverage similar technologies. But now there are thousands of variations of blockchains and cryptocurrency tokens, all vying for prominence and adoption. What is most notable about all this activity is how far the notion of blockchain has strayed from the original idea of Bitcoin. Bitcoin has been embraced by groups of people with differing ideas about what it should be and what problems it should, it should try and solve. It's gone through various alterations over the years and many of its most prominent pundits have embraced the idea that it should not be cash but some kind of new asset, one that can replace gold as a store of value and act as a hedge against fiat currency inflation and debasement. Their focus isn't to create a low-cost transactional system, but rather a secure digital asset storage that cannot be imposed upon by government rules and regulations. Other blockchain currencies have been created that diverge radically from the original design of Bitcoin. The supporters of these currencies aren't happy with the transparent nature of Bitcoin, and so they've added anonymity and other obfuscation features to make it difficult for law enforcement and tax authorities to have visibility into their activities. So now to understand the nature of Bitcoin, how it works and, and why it's useful, I'm going to start off by describing the various moving parts of the system and how they all come together. At its most fundamental level, Bitcoin is made up of large, independent, commercialized entities and companies, which are, are colloquially known as miners, and they operate data centers. These data centers act as transaction processes in much the same way that banks do by processing customer transactions. These companies are distributed geographically and they act independently, each competing with the others to be the first to process transactions and earn fees. A fixed amount of 21 million tokens, each divisible by 100 million, were issued at Bitcoin's launch. And these are distributed to the miners as a subsidy to bootstrap the system. Now, when all the tokens or, or coins are distributed, the transaction processors or miners will depend entirely on the fees per transaction that is processed for income. They 
also have a temporary store, which we call a mempool, which uh, collects the unprocessed transactions ready for processing. When someone makes a payment using Bitcoin, the transaction is broadcast to the network. All the miners collect those transactions and begin processing them. The first miner to complete the process notifies all the other miners, who then check to see if the batch or the block of transactions was processed correctly. If they agree, then they immediately stop processing their own block, accept the received block and add it to their local repository. The successful miner will then receive the fees attached to all the transactions in the block and a portion of the issued tokens. This process then starts again. Users go and create transactions. A miner completes the processing, shares the block with the other miners. They then again validate the block and if accepted, they attach the new block to the previous one. In this way, a conceptual chain of blocks is created over time and hence the word blockchain. In the original design of Bitcoin, there was no limit defined as to the size of the blocks, which meant that miners were not limited to how many transactions they could process in a single block. And this, of course, is desirable because it means that Bitcoin can scale to process extremely large transaction volumes at very low costs per transaction, more so than Visa and, and all the other major payment processing networks. But not everybody in Bitcoin shares this desire. And so to further understand Bitcoin and its history, it's important to talk about the concept of forks. Now, after Bitcoin was released, a number of other cryptocurrency competitors started appearing, which were loosely based on the original design. They developed their own brands, removed functionality, and included new and distinct features. The Bitcoin community as a whole had always been famously reluctant to make changes to its original design, yet there were some influential people within the community who did desire change. And this came to a head in 2017 when the community split over implemented changes which radically altered Bitcoin from its original design. An important alteration is called SegWit, which removes the digital signature from the transaction payload. And another is called Replace by Fee, which allows transactions to be rebroadcast with different recipients. Proponents of this altered version of Bitcoin are also committed to keeping blocks small and therefore transaction throughput low for the mistaken view that this achieves greater decentralization of the network and keeps it outside of a regulatory purview. Given the prominence of those advocates for these alterations, Bitcoin exchanges around the world declared that the altered version of Bitcoin would maintain the original ticker symbol BTC, which is used to identify it on exchanges. The remaining members of the Bitcoin community who did not advocate for those changes were forced to rebrand the unaltered version to Bitcoin Cash. And the exchanges then assigned a new ticker symbol, BCH, to the currency. And this happened again in 2018 when prominent members of the Bitcoin Cash community desired alterations. New operational functionality was included and the community split. Exchanges assigned the BCH symbol to the new altered version and the unchanged version was forced to use a new symbol BSV. This stands for Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, alluding to the fact that it conforms to the inventor's original design and vision for Bitcoin. Now, this has created some confusion in the market as to which Bitcoin represents the original. Most traders and speculators on exchanges aren't aware of this history and believe that since the Bitcoin they trade still has the same ticker symbol, it must be the first and most valuable. But why does this matter and what difference does it make? 
An argument that is used by the proponents of an ever-changing Bitcoin is that technologies always evolve. If they remain stagnant, they soon become obsolete. An example that is pointed at is the evolution of cars. They've been improving and employing new innovations for more than 100 years. Imagine if the only choice we had was to drive around in a Model T. This argument confuses the rules of the system with its actual implementation. When we talk about altering Bitcoin, we are referring to the rules or protocol that governs the system and not the software technologies that implement those rules. In terms of cars, the protocol is more like the rules of the road and not the cars themselves. It's possible to use innovation and technology to create any vehicle and for any purpose one likes, as long as it follows a predefined set of rules. These rules define what functions the vehicle must have, like the ability to brake and stop, have indicator lights, review mirrors and seat belts. The vehicle must drive on the right hand side, stop at red lights and yield at certain crossings. If the rules change arbitrarily, it creates chaos and confusion. If a fundamental rule was removed or changed, all vehicles would have to be retrofitted and altered and drivers would need to be retrained, incurring costs and delays. But by ensuring that the rules of the system remain constant, then drivers and those affected by traffic can rest assured that the system will run smoothly and without surprises. They will be confident in making investments in research and capital, knowing that they will not be obsolete sometime in the future. Neighborhoods and businesses will flourish and the world will continue to progress. This is precisely what made the internet so successful, useful and pervasive today. The internet depends on a whole number of protocols which govern the rules around how information flows through the networks. These protocols form the foundation of the internet. If these protocols were subject to change, then no businesses like Google and Amazon, Facebook, Netflix would ever have invested the capital and resources into it by creating services and applications that we depend on today. They would have had to constantly invest enormous sums of money just to keep their existing software from breaking as the foundations they were built upon shifted. These companies now are free to innovate and create new technologies that serve us, but only so long as they follow the rules of the internet protocols. Bitcoin is exactly the same. It is a protocol which defines how data and transactions flow around its network. Given a stable protocol, businesses are now free to invest and innovate, having the confidence that the underlying foundation will not change over time. This is why at Centpi, we've decided to support the original Bitcoin protocol. We believe in the principles that made the internet great and we see the same principles apply to Bitcoin as a protocol. But a protocol does not immediately imply value. All it provides is a stable foundation with basic rules. As with the internet, value comes from the useful applications and services it can support, and not just simply through the fact of its existence. At Centbee, we have realized that without an ecosystem of utilities and service providers, Bitcoin itself will never become useful. An ecosystem consists of a diverse array of participants, all providing a piece of the puzzle, leading to synergy and sustainability. And we've been building an ecosystem to be able to realize the vision of Bitcoin as a cash system. To do this, we've had to develop a number of components and find the right partners. If Bitcoin is to be used as cash, it must be easy to access and use. Given the technical aspects of Bitcoin, it is important to not confuse users with jargon 
and difficult concepts. We started out conceiving of a simple mobile wallet that looks and acts like a standard digital wallet. It allows users to easily send money to their contacts and uses a simple recipient address scheme, which is similar to email. It's called PayMail. In this way, users don't need to see and understand complicated Bitcoin address schemes. Most people today use cryptocurrency exchanges to acquire Bitcoin. But these are too complicated for inexperienced users. We wanted to make acquiring Bitcoin simple without having to use multiple services. We created the ability to purchase Bitcoin inside the SendPay wallet directly from the user's bank account. Users receive their Bitcoin instantly, although this only works for people who have access to bank accounts. For users who don't have access to a bank account, we developed a system inside the wallet which allows them to purchase Bitcoin at all the major supermarkets and smaller stores in the country. This means that users can top up their wallet with Bitcoin by using cash or debit cards. The process is as simple as creating a barcode inside the SendP wallet, showing it to the teller and allowing them to scan it. Once payment is made, Bitcoin is instantly transferred to the wallet. We've managed to achieve country-wide scale in South Africa, and we will be bringing these features to, the other, to other countries. These features inside SendP have made it possible for normal people to access and hold Bitcoin. Having Bitcoin, but not being able to use it, defeats the purpose of its existence. Without being able to send or spend Bitcoin, it remains an interesting idea, but with no practical use case. This is largely the point where most crypto enthusiasts stop and say that owning Bitcoin is an end in itself. That if they can hold it for long enough, it will grow in value and they will be able to cash out and be rich. This is the unfortunate false notion about what Bitcoin is all about. Without being able to spend your cash, there's no point in having it. At Centbee, spending Bitcoin is the most important aspect. We have included a number of value-added services inside the Centbee wallet so that users can use their Bitcoin as cash. Centbee users can purchase mobile airtime and data, electricity, Uber, Netflix, gaming vouchers, a whole lot of other things. And we'll be adding a lot more in the wallet over time. There are many Bitcoin and cryptocurrency components that openly reject regulation and government oversight. Bitcoin was intentionally designed so that regulators and tax authorities and law enforcement could have visibility on transactions. At CentB, we require users who want to make use of the top up and withdrawal features to provide personal identification information which can be used to do anti-money laundering and other checks. This is a vital requirement for us to be able to fulfill our obligations and to provide comfort to the local regulators that we don't facilitate crime. Based on the information provided to us, we can then limit how much local currency flows in and out of the wallet. This is the only way that Bitcoin will gain acceptance and widespread adoption. Bitcoin is a new idea but the principles it is based upon are not. We have seen how the internet developed over time, and this can be a guide in determining how things will progress. The only way for Bitcoin to succeed is if it maintains the idea of a stable protocol that is scalable and cheap to use, and which conforms to all local rules and regulations. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found that interesting and informative. If you would like to know more about CentB, please follow us on Twitter at CentB, or you can go to our website, centb.com. Thank you very much for your time.